topic of tonight's webinar is introducing and implementing sustainable long-term athlete development practices in your club. Uh, delivering tonight will be myself, Connor O'Toole, the Games Development Manager for Down GA, and I'm joined by Gareth Thornton, uh, Club Coaching Development Officer from the Ulster Council. Just as a starting point this evening, folks, and you're all very welcome, I would ask our County Coaching Officer, who's on the line as well this evening, Carl Oakes from Dunpatrick, to uh, come on and say a few words. Thanks, Carl. Cheers, Connor. Um, just want to welcome everyone here to this evening's webinar. Hopefully, um, it won't take up too much of your time. It's maybe an hour, just over an hour long. I know you're probably inundated with online uh, meetings at this stage and probably got, like the rest of us got a wee bit of fatigue around all, all the, the webinar. So it is a different format. Ideally, we would like to be doing this on the pitch, hands on, as coaching should be. Um, but uh, Appreciate that Connor and Gareth will make the best of a, a, a bad situation here as, as we navigate through this. So as Connor said, this is a, a series of webinars and hopefully it'll provide a wee bit of uh, upskilling for your for your coaches. If there's any burning questions or queries, hopefully the people on the line have enough experience to try and answer them. Uh, may not be the answer you're looking for, but we'll, we'll, we'll try our best uh, in that. Um, I suppose my remit is, as the, the coaching officer for Down is is to look at what supports available um, through through the staff, uh, what's the best method of delivery and what is the best content and that, that will be driven by the clubs as well. So if there's any particular area that, that you would like maybe a further discussion on, happy to happy to pursue those and hopefully over the, the coming weeks and, and months we will be getting some um, best practice examples from maybe outside the, the county, um, particularly with uh, juvenile development, because that is the, the fundamental building blocks for all our clubs and for the county as well. So hopefully there will be some um, enlightening uh, best practice examples from, from outside the county over the coming weeks and months. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, beyond that, we're looking at a longer term plan for the county, uh, which is uh, fallen uh, with myself and the chairperson and secretary of the county as well, just to look at a probably a more of a longer term strategy to take in schools, clubs, uh, the Morn Academy, all all the the different elements of uh, development and coaching development in the county, and that's a set, uh, and running in tandem with the the normal um, coach education that would be delivered uh, out from the Ulster Council. So that's just a, a quick. Overview. Hopefully, you'll get some benefit uh, out of this tonight. There is a, an ongoing chat bar. Uh, any quick questions, uh, post them up in the chat, and we'll try and uh, answer them as best we can at the end of the session. So, I'll hand you back over to Connor, who's going to kick off this evening session. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, look, just as Carl mentioned briefly, there are uh, folks towards the end. Uh, the chat facility is available this evening. If you haven't got it accessed on your screen already, if you move your mouse about there and it'll bring it up the wee toggle screen where you would mute or unmute your camera, there you'll notice that there's a hand signal for if you're welcome to put your hand up at any time if you have a question that you would like to ask. And beside the hand signal, there's also a wee uh, voice box, which if you click on it, it will bring the chat facility up down the right hand side of your screen. We will be using that at various stages tonight, so I would encourage you to do that if possible. And uh, please feel free to be uh, uh, get as involved as you wish. So as I say, there will be opportunities throughout the night for engagement. Thank you. Gareth will introduce this evening's content and the initial part of the presentation. So uh, I'll hand over to Gareth. Okay, thank you, Connor. Um, so folks, the content for this evening's webinar is through the club model and where the coaching officer, the, the coaching committee, the club committee, and the new player, the player framework, where it all fits in um, as a whole. The role and responsibilities of the club coaching officer, long-term athlete development. So what is it and why do we do it and how it's going to improve our players and in turn improve our club. Introduction to the new GA F10 player development model. Introducing long-term athlete development into your club and upskilling your club coaches on this area. What gets measured gets done. So standardizing club coaching approaches to player development aligning with the new F10 framework. Moving forward and changing mindsets in your club, and then there'll be time set aside at the end for some question and answers. So the club model, where all this fits, so as we start with the club committee, um, without a club committee, 
back in coaching and games in the club, you know, you're you're, you're going to be off on on the wrong foot straight away. You know, at the end of the day, without coaching and games taking place in the club, we don't have clubs. So, um, it it is seen it is seen very it should be seen very very important. You know, you'll see in yellow there the role of the club coaching officer. Um, again, probably a relatively new role that has been formalised within clubs in the past couple of years. The club coaching officer role, in my own opinion, is is as an important role in the club. You know, without a structured coaching and games program, um, or or some sort of an organised structure in your club, how effective is the coaching and games that's taken that that is going on or happening in your club? And this is all driven by the club coaching officer. In the last couple of years, um, uh, within Ulster, we have now started delivering a new officer workshop training. So we, we hold you know, three, four hour workshops just on the roles and responsibilities of club coaching officer and, and try and engage and upskill club coaching officers that, that they're carrying out all the roles and responsibilities to the best of their ability. The club coaching officer will, ha- will have a strong link with the club committee. You know, the, the club coaching officer needs a voice on the club committee. They need to know that they have the committee's backing and um, that whatever they're trying to do, that, that, that they're doing it for the right reasons. As a result of that, then, you know, Hopefully, all of our clubs here have a club coaching committee, and, and we, we'll move on to even more detail on that. So, we have the club coaching officer who feeds in, who chairs, and then we'll feed into the club coaching committee. The club coaching committee will then feed into our coaching teams, and then all of our coaches will then feed into the player development pathway. Um, and I suppose through this player development pathway tonight and over the next four weeks, we're going to explore what the content of it is and then so how and why and what we should be coaching at each of the age groups. Responsibilities of a club coaching officer. So Justin, if you could just raise your hand at the icon at the top. Um, and if your club has a functioning club coaching committee, could you raise your hand? So we've got so we've 62, 63 people on this call. Yes, there may be people from the same club here, but if you've got a functioning club coaching committee, if you could raise your hand for me. Okay, so we're sitting around 27, 28 people there who have raised their hands, um, who have raised their hands there to say that they have a they have a function or a functioning club coaching committee in their club. So listen, one of the one of the roles and responsibilities of uh so as coaching officer is to ensure that there is a coaching committee in the club. How do we set a coaching committee up? Um my own opinion is that we should have one member of each age group on the coaching committee. Does that need to be the lead coach or the manager of each age group? No, it doesn't. It just needs to be one person from that age group that's going to, I suppose, add value to the coaching committee. You know, you need to have people who are good organisers, good communicators, maybe people who can go and seek a wee bit of funding or whatever it may be, but somebody who's, who is coaching in games minded that's going to add value. You don't want of any time wasters or, you know, to pay people like that on, on your coaching committee. You know, if you think if you're sevens, nines, elevens, thirteens, fifteens and seventeens, we've six teams plus the coaching officer maybe somebody from the club committee, you know, we're maybe looking at eight people in total on a coaching committee. Um, you know, so we Yeah, so look, obviously as Gareth would have mentioned, um the role of club coaching officer is absolutely central to everything that goes on in the club. Uh, and their ability to sit on the club committee and interact with the club committee and be a voice on the club committee is really it's of paramount importance. There's no point having a club coaching officer out there working day to day on the ground if uh, if it's not the case, if it's not something that's being well received by the club, supported by the club, backed by the club. Uh, another addition to the, the, the role and responsibility within with the club coaching officer, I suppose, is to oversee the appointment of juvenile coaching teams. Um, it's often said, I suppose, and I would have heard this, this would have been put to me at numerous times at club visits and interacting with club coaching officers where they'll say that the only thing harder than coaching the nursery age children within the club is getting other people to coach the nursery age children within the club. And that's probably the, the, te- the, the true testament of just how difficult the club coaching officer's role can be, uh, putting the right people in place to work at the right levels and people who have the right focus and the right mindset and a developmental approach to what they do. The division now, the devising and overseeing of a, an implementation of a club a coaching plan, of course, is hugely important. Uh, overseeing the delivery of external and internal coach education opportunities for club coaches. A club coaching officer should always encourage a developmental approach to coaching practices within the club and most importantly perhaps act as a support network and mentor to club coaches throughout the season. We all uh, we all have experience 
of being asked to come to perhaps a mentors meeting at the start of the year where a club coaching officer or a club coaching committee will issue their various management teams out with balls and bibs and cones. And very often that will be the last contact or the last interaction that takes place between the, the coaching officer and the management teams. And then at the end of that year, or perhaps the start of the following season, whenever the whenever the, the coaching officer approaches those same management teams with a view to probably reappointing them or hoping to gain their support again for the following year, they're maybe hit with a whole raft of problems or issues that uh, a whole, hit with a whole raft of issues that perhaps the, the coaches have faced throughout the past 12 months that the coaching officer and the coaching committee were completely unaware of by virtue of the fact that as soon as they got them out onto the grass, everybody, the coaching officer or the coaching committee kind of down tools. So it's vitally important that the, the club coaching officer is there throughout the year in the background, networking and acting as a mentor for the club coaches. Uh, you should continuously review and assess the coaching practices taking place at juvenile level within your club. Uh, there's nobody suggesting even for a moment that a club coaching officer should be the, the big brother watching over the club coaches, but they should certainly have an input into what is being delivered and they should certainly be encouraging the coaching teams within the club to deliver certain in a certain manner and deliver certain content with a view to meeting the long-term objectives of the club. Ensure coach and player adherence to the club code of conduct. Uh, one of the questions that we received this evening uh, in advance of the, in advance of the, uh, the, presenta the presentation tonight was from one of, one, of your, one of yourselves, just querying, you know, is it the responsibility of a club coaching officer to, uh, to deal with disciplinary issues within the club or breaches of the code of conduct? In my own personal opinion, probably not. Uh, the, the code of conduct should really be upheld by the senior officers or the club executive within the club. Uh, the club coaching officer, that's probably slightly without saying their remit, so I'm sure some of you will breathe a, a sigh of relief to hear that. So certainly, look, you might be involved in, in sorting issues out that present themselves, but by and large, you know, issuing disciplinary or, or taking disciplinary action against a club member or parent, juvenile player, whatever the case may be, that really should lie uh, at the feet of the club executive. Finally, uh, understand the rationale behind and need for uh, a long-term athlete development practices to be ruled out within the club. Okay, and look, this is this I suppose is very much the focus of uh, of tonight's presentation. Um, you'll have seen the posters that we've put out over the last number of weeks about introducing long-term athlete development to the clubs, and you know, for a lot of people probably sitting back asking, well, what exactly is long-term athlete development? Some of you may be more familiar with the, the, the terminology and the jargon around coaching than others. But look, the reality is this is happening in, in the large majority of our clubs. It may not be as organized or as structured as we would necessarily like it to be, but by and large, long-term athlete development is simply the practices that take place within a club to try and have, give the players the best opportunity to be the very best that they could be. Uh, the term itself was devised in the early 2000s by uh, a globally renowned coach educator known as Dr. Istvan Bali. Uh, Bali was very well renowned in the whole area of, of sports development and has worked with a large number of sporting governing bodies in terms of putting in place long-term strategies for, for athlete development. Uh, Bali produced a long-term athlete development model which he believed could be applied to any sporting organisation at any level. We wanted to support athletes and players in reaching their full performance potential. The principle of long-term athlete development is that it identifies stages of athletic development and more importantly details what athletes of all ages should be doing to maximize their potential uh, for success. Bali's model has been adopted as best practice by the majority of sporting bo uh, governing bodies across the world including the GAA and I'm sure the large majority of you will be familiar with that poster that player pathway which uh, is just to the right of the text there. Uh, that's the Ulster GEA player pathway and disability player pathway, which was released about four or five years ago. I'm sure that's probably hanging on a wall somewhere or in a dressing room or in a corridor around most of the club rooms around the county. And if you cast your eye at it and just compare it to some of the other models just above, you'll notice that they're all very, very similar. They all have the exact same stages of development. They start off with an active start or Gaelic start. They progress through the various uh, learn to train, train to train, train to compete, train to win. The terminology is the same, whether it's being applied to rugby in New Zealand or whether it's being applied to the GEA in Ulster. Uh, as I say, this is Bali's model. The GEA, however, in late 2019, have introduced a new player development model, but still based very much on Bali's principles of long-term athlete development. The, 
new framework, which is known within the GA circles as an F10 framework, focuses on four key stages. It focuses initially on a foundation stage where players will primarily be operating at club level, both at juvenile and right through to club senior level. Beyond that, then, it moves into more of an elite pathway uh, and, and indeed more of a county setup where players would uh, progress to a talent phase, into an elite phase, and finally uh, into a mastery phase. Now, you'll notice on the next screen when we look at the, 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 the framework in more detail that the GA haven't even included the mastery phase, so they haven't in their documentation. This, uh, this framework came about following a process which was conducted in 2018 and 19 by the newly formed uh, Player Development Review Committee in Croke Park, which was focusing on the effectiveness of existing GEA practices around player development. Uh, the findings from that report, I suppose, are from that group were that the GEA needed to adopt a more club-focused player development model moving forward, given that the club is the, the clubs are the, are the mainstay of our organization and that you know, we have thousands of clubs across the 32 counties. So by, by virtue of population and size alone, the clubs are the dominating, the dominating scene. Uh, there needs to be an increased emphasis on the standards of club coaching and that uh, by developing better people, leading to better players. Okay, so it's very much adopting a holistic approach to everything that we do. And so look, if you just want to cast your eye across the various stages, this is the new player development, the new uh, F10 model. As you'll notice there, it's, it's comprised of a number of, uh, of, of circles or zones or, or stages as they're known within the, within the framework. Down in the bottom left there at the juvenile end, you see at, at, at an introductory level at the F1 <clears throat> and the F2. The F1 and the F2 then overlinked with the adult youth section in the middle, which is known as F3. Now, those initial three stages are going to be the very much the focus of our webinars over the coming weeks, where we will be working or hopefully working with your club coaches who work at the F1 stage, the F2 stage, and the F3 stage within your club. The F3 does uh, contribute to the, in, to the adult club section as well, but over the coming weeks, we're just going to focus on the, on the juvenile section within the club. To the right then of the, of the new model, you'll see that you sort of venture into the T phase, which is T1, T2, T3, and T4, which is really known as the talent phase within this framework. Those are players who, in the T1 and the T2, would be starting to make their way into perhaps county uh, emerging talent squads, county academy squads. And then as they make their way up into T T3, which would be uh, under-17 inter-county representative football in Hurling, T4, which would be under-20 representative football in Hurling, and then the elite phase, which is the, the Stephen Cluxton one there, you can see at the top, that's the, the high performance stage, only applicable within this framework to inter-county senior participation, football, hurling, ladies football, et cetera. Um, okay, so how does this all apply then to, to a club model? How does it all apply to a county? The, the new framework, by its very nature and, and purpose, can be applied to all units within the association who have a focus on developing players. So if you cast your eye down the left-hand side of the picture there underneath the Bally home player and the picture of, of Dahi Sands, I believe it is, you'll see that the, the club model is very much based around the F stage of the, of the F10 framework, where initially you have a foundation one phase known as F1, which focuses purely on the development of players aged four to seven. Players then progress uh, through the, the stage to F2, which focuses purely on the developmental age 8 to 11. Players then move into the F3 phase of their development, which focuses on the development of players age 12 to 16. Now, as I mentioned on the previous slide, we have a, we have a, previous, we have a, a, a subsection as well within the F3 stage, which applies to adult players, which we're not going to focus on over the next coming weeks. Down the right-hand side of that diagram, then you'll see that we have uh, the foundation phase of at county level, which would really apply to clubs and school activity. So you're sort of talking about your under 17 club and the adult levels, the adult, uh, the older years within school. Players within the county model then would progress into the T phase, which is the talent through the emerging talent squads or talent academies. From that, they would progress through the sub elite phase at under 17 and under 20 under county squads. Finally, all being well, progressing to the, to the elite phase, which would be senior inter-county squads. Okay, have we any questions at that, around any of this? If you would like to stick any of the questions at this point into the, into the box. No, all good. Thank you. Okay, so uh, initially, 
over the next number of weeks, the purpose of our webinar, the purpose of our webinar is uh, just to focus really on the initial, the F1, the F2, and the F3 phases of development. Uh, each webinar will focus on one of these areas, which is why I suppose we we're going to request that you uh, encourage your club coaches initially on the F1 night, which will be next Monday night, to attend the, uh, the, the, the initial webinar for players aged four to seven. The second webinar then in, in two weeks' time will focus on players aged eight to 11, with the third and final workshop focusing on players aged 12 to 16. In terms of the content of what we're hoping to deliver across those three workshops, uh, webinar two next Monday nights will very much focus on le learning and acquiring basic movement skills in young players. The focus group for this will be players aged four to seven years, but we will be breaking that evening up into two smaller subcategories. Uh, we are aware that there are developmental differences between players aged four to five and also aged six to seven. It would be very naive to be to think that a player aged seven would be similar in either strength, stature, or performance to a player aged four. So we will be identifying key differences within that age group for, for players in each of those sections. We will be focusing on how and why to introduce nursery practices within your club and why it's beneficial for clubs to do so. Probably the key area of what we're trying to achieve then across the coming weeks, how, why, and what to coach, aged, coach kids aged four to seven. We will be focusing uh, on specific areas of fundamental movement and physical literacy in children that should be developed in this phase of their, of their development, aligning with the new F10 model. The second night then, as we move into that eight to 11 age group, we'll focus on skill extension and refinement. Okay, so the, you'll, your coaches will find that towards the six to seven uh, years age group, the, the previous night, we will be starting to introduce core GEA skills to players. This eight to 11 age group is where the skill expertise starts to come in, skill refinement, uh, development skills through games-based uh, training methods, introduction of core tactical principles to young players around support and play, the basic uh, introduction to attacking and defending principles, and safe and fun athletic development practices applicable to this age group. Our third and final webinar then, which we will be inviting coaches of players aged 12 to 16, to, uh, to log into and to attend. Again, how, why, and what to coach players aged 12 to 16. We will be developing technical excellence uh, in a competitive environment, and we'll be exploring the best methods of doing that, be it through games-based uh, training simulation, be it through increased emphasis on perhaps tackling, and of course, introduce, introducing systems of play to youth players. We will also, at that particular night, uh, be introducing athletic development practices to prepare young players for the rigors of senior football, which all being well, they should be familiarizing themselves with uh, over the common weeks and months ahead. Okay. So listen, measuring progress. So I suppose as, as coaches in our club, how do we know if our coaching is working? Um, you know, so uh, as a coach or as a coaching officer, when you're seeing what's happening on the grass a couple of times a week and at the weekend, and we're looking at our games and stuff, how do we know what we're doing is actually working in our club? Um, you know, so if there's somebody wants to put their hand up and, and we can unmute them and you can come in and, and verbally ver ver verbally talk about this, feel free to do so. Um, I see there, there are quite a lot of hands up already, even if you want to type in the chat box and, and I can unmute you from, from, from our side here. So how do you know or how do we know as coaches and coaching officers that our coaching in the club is working? Gareth, could I, could I maybe suggest that we have a couple of people within the room that I would certainly be familiar with in terms of working on a day-to-day -day basis with clubs. And, you know, I, I'm, there are people that I, I know have certainly in, in engaged with this process and have been doing so successfully for the last number of years. Um, Sean Gallagher from Shamrocks is on the call, I believe. If Sean wouldn't mind, maybe just maybe just giving us a wee bit of the background to the type of work that Sean would have done within the, the Shamrocks Academy over the last number of years, if he would be willing to do so. Whenever we're waiting there in Connors, well, somebody's put in there about player retention, which is suppose that's that's one of the things that I suppose is key. If your players are coming back to training week on week, um, that's something to suggest that that your that your coaching is working. Probably on the flip side of that. If you find that your your numbers in, in your sessions are dropping week on week before blaming a young fella or, or a young girl or, or blaming mommy or daddy for not having a whole pile of interest, as a coach, we probably need to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, right, well, are we providing a fun session? Are we providing enough in our training sessions to make to make 
we Johnny come back every week, you know, and those kids are the most honest people that you'll meet. Um, in, in terms of, you know, uh, as a parent, you say to the child, did you enjoy that today? A, a child's going to say to you, yes or no, you know, so if, if the answer is no, as a parent, you know, you, we may struggle to get our players back through. Absolutely, Kev, I, I have Sean, I'm, I'm just going to share a presenting uh, facility there with Sean, if Sean wants to come in now. No, I was, I was just saying, I mean, we're, we're about, about six, six or seven years into a, a sort of a complete rejig of our underage structures in the club, and we've sort of started with a group right, uh, right through that are now sort of all, mostly moving into under 13. What we found in terms of retaining the big numbers, I mean, P1s and 2s, uh, the numbers were all really big anyway because parents were very keen for their for their kids to initially get involved. We would have run a winter program with sort of indoor um, stations and that sort of thing at the Abbey there and would have had sort of big numbers at it. Um, and the, the sort of the key to retention uh, from our point of view, and I realise that things are, are a wee bit uh, unique when you're when you're in a big urban uh, area like this but the thing that we found really important was getting to know the parents and getting a, a sort of a buy-in from the parents um, and really getting to know the kids and linking in with the primary schools and getting into the primary school and doing a wee bit of extra coaching in there as well. Um, I suppose I've been lucky enough with I work in, in the Abbey in Uri, which is beside our, our main feeder primary school and we've been able to kind of share resources and facilities and that sort of thing which has really brought uh, brought the schools on as well. But in terms of the the underage of this, we we've really followed the the Ulster Council's uh, template in terms of the certainly P one, two, and three, and and even into P four, where it's all sort of basic fundamental movement and and uh, games, and there's very there's very little of it really as you you would recognise as as football training, and we use sponge balls and and things like that, and then as we move up through uh, into P four and they start to go to we different competitions and that sort of thing. Uh, the key, the key at every stage for us is just to really keep a visual presence of the club in in the minds of these wee ones and in their in their families' minds as much as anything else. As I say, and I know in the uh, in the rural clubs it might be slightly different in that 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 sort of focus is there already and that the, the the clubs the the community's hub. That's not really the case in in big towns and that. So things like our uh, branding of our club. Uh, crest and that sort of thing in being it being visible in the schools and organizing sort of extra family orientated activities and that sort of thing we found to be really important to just keeping the kids wanting to come to the club so i mean the big emphasis is, has been on fun really at, at those really really young age groups um so those are those those are the kind of things that we we've been working at and, and have been building on as we as we go along and now as i say we're the, the main sort of start, the first cohort of that at under 13 are now sort of ready to start taking part in leagues and competitions and whatever else. Brilliant. Sean, just want to go back to something you said. You talked about um, so trying to engage with the parents and get to know the parents. And it's something that's probably, you know, I would find working in clubs that, that is massive in terms of trying to get parents involved. Um, and especially at that, the child age group, you know, under six, under eight or sevens or nines, you know, Mommy and daddy have to take the children to training. They have to stay about. So how do we engage with them, you know? And probably more so now than ever, I think it's something that our clubs need to be looking at is you know, we've we've done the skills test and, and we've tried to keep our players active over the past, I suppose, six, nine months. But as clubs, have we touched base with mommy and daddy? Because they're the ones who have to so bring the children back. And especially in, in you know the, the bigger areas where maybe the GA isn't the be all end all. Was there anything you've done to try and get parents on board? Uh, yeah, the, the, we do. We have a thing now that's an annual uh, event, Gareth, which was uh, sort of based around uh, uh, the idea of come dine with me. Well, ours was come train with me, where we basically asked the uh, the kids on a Sunday to bring a significant adult with them, or a parent, or an uncle, or a big brother, or something, to come and train with them, and we gave them a ball each. Uh, and it was basically, I suppose, from our point of view, it was for the parents to hear. Uh, the language that we use when we're coaching them. So, like, if we, if we were coaching a P3, for example, we would use phrases like arms to catch and different body shapes and, and sort of based around animals and things like that as well. We are sort of getting them to stand like a flamingo on one leg and that type of thing. So, whenever we're doing those sort of balancing things or catching exercises, that come train with me event, uh, the parent 
is hearing us use that terminology and they'll hope that when they're playing out the back that they'll be able to sort of repeat the coaching language that we're using. Um, so we found that really, really successful. And again, the other side of it too is that there, there's a, we have sort of appealed to the big child in all of us. Like the parents actually enjoyed the session themselves and enjoyed sort of sharing that moment with our kids and enjoyed sharing the training session. And that's something that we would have got a lot of positive feedback on. And that's now an annual thing. And we would sort of tie that in then with a sort of a, we would have a cafe or something running down at the back pitch on on that, on the day that that's done. And there's a wee bit of a sort of atmosphere and people milling about and a bit of music blurring about over the, the, the PA and that. So it's just to sort of create the family day. The other thing we did was uh, St. Patrick's Day, where we sort of built around uh, in an internal competition on St. Patrick's Day. Again, sort of, I suppose, area like Newry here wouldn't have maybe... A, Certain times of St Patrick's Day afternoon wouldn't have a great reputation in terms of how things kind of how things go after the parades and that. So we organised an event at the club and it was based around, as I say, internal blitzes, skills competitions, and um, we linked in with the Ulster Council actually in one year with with Pierce uh, Carrity there and the the game of three halves, and it was just it was just brilliant, you know. And again, all of those things create really really good goodwill among the parents and they see that they're that people are sort of putting effort into their kids and everything else and that has been crucial in terms of retention and I mean from our point of view now like we would have started off as I said the, the our current under 13 cohort uh, we would we now have I think 36 or 37 players in that bracket uh, as compared to maybe 17, 18, six years ago, which is which is a significant improvement. And that is, they've come through all of those different events, which we're now sort of running each year. Brilliant. Sean, that's brilliant. Listen, and, and some, some great practical examples there that hopefully other clubs and, and coaching officers on, on the call can can take away and maybe try and implement within their own clubs. And I suppose one of the big things in always are trying to do is create that identity um, in, in an urban area, which which is huge, you know. And, and I suppose if we can, if if we can get all our clubs that have an identity, our players have an identity and affinity to your clubs, you're hoping that they'll they'll, they'll stay on, you know. So. Listen, there, there's probably the, the key message here is how you know where coaching is working. No, number one, it's it's player retention. Um, you know, number two is in terms of our skill development, our, our is the skill set of our players improving month on month, you know, throughout the season, year on year, and, and how do we monitor that? And then probably as we go up through the age grades, you know, I suppose this this big word success that we don't want to get bogged down in, but it probably is a, a key factor in knowing if and how our coaching is working. Um, I suppose it's back to your club and having your coaching plan in place and maybe looking to say, well, what is success for our club? You know, so success at under 11 for Newry Shamrocks is going to be different than what well, it may be different for Lock and Island, but a, a, as a club and as a group of coaches, if you can define what success is on a yearly basis and then tailor your coaching to suit the needs of your group to try and achieve whatever whatever success is and I say it might be player retention it could be making everyone be able to kick with both sides or become more comfortable in both sides it alternatively could be when you get to under 15 or under 17 to win the A competition or the A championship in that age grade so a, a, every club will will have a different way of measuring it again for looking for some feedback here via the chat box or, or else un, unmute yourself how do we know if we are covering the correct skills at the correct time? So as coaches, how do we know that we're covering the correct skills at the correct time? Okay, somebody coming through there, the, the player pathway. Okay, so Connor, Connor will allude a wee bit to measuring progress in, in the next couple of slides. But yes, listen, the, the player pathway is probably the the... The bones of it, um, you know, the player pathway and the new F10 model will describe exactly what those, what 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 pillars need to be hitting for our players. It's probably up to us as coaches to add a wee bit of meat to the bones as to what that looks like for for your age group. Um, you know, an under seven in a certain club may be further developed than than somewhere else, but it's always it's it's again it's, it's you knowing the dynamic of of your team and your players and saying right, well, how can I? I suppose cater for all here, and 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 what 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 is is what I'm doing? Is it applicable and is it improving proven each of these players? Um, you know, so probably back to your player pathway is the main way of looking. Say, well, at under seven, you know, I always say to club coaches, ask yourself the question: What do you want your under seven players to look like at the end of the season? And then 
work backwards then. So what am I going to do as a coach or a group of coaches or a management team to try and get our players to look like this? They're not all going to get there, but you know, if you've different stages throughout, I suppose throughout the year, there's to you know different milestones you need to hit, and hopefully by the end of the year, you have as many and as, as as close to that as you want. If you don't get there, you know we we'll have to be mindful of those that the, the players who are, who are going to develop a wee bit later. But you know, if we're able to tick that box from seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, fifteen, what do we want our players to look like from a skill, from an athletic and a holistic point of view? You know, and then be able to work backwards then. And then I suppose the last one, um, as coaches and coaching officers and clubs, are we expecting too much? So again, if there's anyone wants to put the hand up or put a message in the chat box and, and we can unmute you. So are we expecting too much? I think, Gareth, it's probably worth noting there that, you know, there probably is a perception or a, an expectation around the county that if you take a team to a, an under seven blitz or a seven and a half blitz or a nine and a half or an eleven and a half blitz that are a league game. But you know, people will invariably come away from these games or these blitzes pondering what are we doing? Why are, are we wasting our time? You know, because very often, you know, you'll get a you'll have a bad day at the office where you might you might come up against a team who are clearly a lot stronger in their the development pathway than, than perhaps you are yourself. Um, and I suppose you know, it's about asking yourself, why is that? You know, why if why would why did Lock and Island under 11s go down to Caliph, for example, last year and come away with our tail between our legs? And you know, it, it all goes back to the whole to, to the title of of the season. And this is a long term player development pathway, and you know, it's a long term process. It's not something that you can fix overnight, or that you know, as a, as a quick fix or that can be that the changes or the, the results of what you're going to be seeing over the period of, say, six months. It's about having belief in your own convictions that you're doing things the right way and putting in place sustainable practices with coaches who are going to be sustainable and invest their time in the club, you know, and beyond, invest their time in the club beyond the period of time for which they're either coaching themselves or for their, that their children are playing. Uh, it's, a, it's important, it's important to, to have the right people in the right places at the right time. And I suppose in terms of, you know, the, the bottom line of that slide there, of what gets measured gets done. Uh, if I just move on here just briefly, the plan, I suppose, and the purpose of these uh, of these workshops is very much to, to try and upskill coaches uh, across the three uh, age groups within the F, the, the F, uh, the F stage of the, of the F10 model. And, we, we regularly get asked as employees of the GEA or as, as people that work in coaching against development, you know, what should we be doing? When should we be doing it? Um, and I guess, you know, the purpose of the workshops over the coming weeks is very much to answer those questions. You know, we are going to delve in fairly great detail into when you should be doing, what you should be doing, why you should be doing it, and who you should be doing it. You know, at what stages of a player's development you should be doing it. We hope following on from these series of webinars that we're going to leave coaches with something tangible that they can actually hold in their hands. Uh, myself and the other members of the Games Development Department here are in the process of drawing up a new standardised technical skills assessment, which we're going to roll out to all the clubs across the county. And um, we will have one for the under seven, uh, to, sorry, the under four to seven age group. We will have a separate one for the eight to 11 year old children. And we'll have a separate one for 13 to 16 year olds. And even within that, there will be sort of variable activities that can be tailored to meet a child who perhaps is a bit further advanced or perhaps a child who's uh, a bit less advanced than their peers. Uh, in addition to that, the, the purpose of that, I suppose, really, Gareth, is to, to allow coaches to say, well, look, these are the skills that we need to monitor these players on. So these are the skills that we're going to work on moving forward. Uh, in the case of, as I said, the four to seven year old, that F1 stage, it'll be very much fundamental movement and physical literacy based. As you move into the as you move into the the eight to eleven age bracket in the middle, it'll be very much skill development, GEA skills based. And as you move into the thirteen to sixteen, it'll be a lot more sort of game sense based. So it will. But there'll be standardised assessments that coaches can use with their players at the beginning of the year, at the middle of the year, and at the end of the year, so that they have actually something something tangible that they can show that their players are making progress, or that the work that they're doing is actually uh, working, or or that and that they're reaping the rewards of it. In addition to that. We're also going to be um, implementing a new athletic development assessment, again, which club coaches will be able to use with their players. And that, again, will be applicable to that, their, their, their coaching age group. 
So there'll be a, an athletic development assessment for four to seven year olds, a new uh, different one for eight to 11 year olds, and finally one for 13 to 16 year olds. We've been working closely with a few people who uh, work in an s &C environment on a full-time basis or work in the area of athletic development. And, you know, this, these are two exciting projects that we're looking forward to rolling out to the club coaches across the county. Uh, in terms of moving forward with this, um, and I know in conversations that I would have had with Carl, and I'm, I'm probably going to bring Carl in here in a moment or two just to speak briefly around this, but the biggest the biggest challenge, and again, this was a question that we were put, that was one of the questions included in the, with someone, somebody was applying or registering for the event. One of the biggest challenges that you will face with implementing long-term athlete development practices within the club is changing the mindset. It's changing the, the mindset of the coach who wants to look after the under 11 team because his son's on that team and he wants them to be a success. And truth be told, he couldn't give a damn about the under 13s two years later, the under 15s four years later, couldn't care what was happening with the under sevens and the under nines. And the reality is that these people, those type of coaches, very often were not in a position to turn them away. But for the long-term objectives of the club, they're perhaps not the, the best suited people to be working and certainly not within a developmental pathway. The club coaching officers should promote a developmental approach to coaching and games within their club. Focus on developing players who will contribute to the long-term success of your club, not just focusing on winning at under 11s, 13s, 15s, etc. Uh, you should aim to develop a community of practice within your club, which encourages coaches to educate themselves and to share ideas and best practice. Continuously evaluate and review your coaching practices in your club to ensure that how and what coaches are delivering is appropriate um, to their players' stage of development. Hopefully, the new technical and uh, athletic development assessments that we're going to issue all the clubs and we're going to share with club coaches uh, over the following the completion of the fourth uh, webinar, hopefully that will be a useful tool in allowing, uh, allowing club coaches to, to evaluate and have something, as I say, tangible in their hand at the end of the season. Gareth, do you want to come in? Yeah. Okay, so so the next steps, I suppose, um, hopefully take away a message from, from the season's workshop is encourage all your juvenile club coaches to enroll and engage with the webinar applicable to their age group. Um, you know, so we, we've got something catering for all club coaches from nursery right up to under 17. Um, interact with the committee and the club coaches and welcome their input into the development of a club coaching development plan that aligns with the new GA player pathway and its content. You know, so probably going back a step, if your club, uh, if you're sitting there as a coaching officer and you don't have an active or a functional club coaching committee, that's probably the first thing you need to go and get sorted before looking at developing a, a club coaching plan. Um, I suppose there is assistance from, from Ulster GA at the minute um, in terms of, uh, of developing that plan with you, and that, that can be got through through coming to Connor or myself. Encourage co coaches to utilise the new skill and athletic development assessment tools provided by Down GA. So just as Connor alluded to, you know, these things will be they'll be unique for, for each age group. And, and I suppose we, we did a little bit on, on what do we know or how do we know if our coaching's working and what skills we coaching at, at, at what age groups. This will provide us with, with that information and ensure the coaches constantly strive to upskill and develop themselves. You know, so hope, you know, hopefully the, the end is near in terms of um, on getting out in the grass but you know, we probably still have another six eight weeks to try and push a wee bit of coach education with um with our coaches there's lots of resources now on on online you know if you go on to the officer ga youtube um channel if you go on to lancer ga youtube channel the dublin ga youtube channel any webinar that has been carried out over the past 12 months will be recorded there you know and it's, it's just maybe sharing that information with your club coaches and so if somebody takes one thing away out of out of something well it's a that'll be a plus it may feel like an uphill battle at times but the view at the top is, is worth the push so you know as coaching officers on the call here i would be encouraging you to sign up to be a club coaching officer for a minimum of three years you know there are probably some people in this call that have are have been in there 10 years now and can't get out of it but you know year one you may not see a whole pile of change you might be met with maybe more resistance and, than change you know but you have to probably just try and keep the head down and keep working to get everyone on board you know it's probably more so year two and three where you'll see you're starting to get things done and um, you know if a coaching officer is changing every year within the club that means a new person's coming in with new ideas 
you know, and you have to go back and have sort of new conversations and a new way of thinking. Well, if you can commit to this for a minimum of three years, you know, and then hopefully beyond that, you will see that the, the, the benefits are huge. And I suppose ho- hopefully Sean's input there from from the work he's done with Newry Shamrocks over the five or six years would 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 be testament to that. Okay, Connor. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Folks, look, that really, um, in terms of the, the presentation aspect of this evening's webinar, that very, that's pretty much it concluded. We have, uh, as, as Carlo, Carlo, our county coaching officer, obviously spoke at the start of the evening, and we have also got one of our games promotion officers, uh, Liam Hardy from Castle Welland, who's going to join the, the discussion here now. We did get a fair number of questions submitted, so we did whenever people were registering. So we will aim to get through as many of those questions as we can over the next sort of 15 or maybe 10 or 15 minutes. We're not going to Take people take up too much uh, of people's time and look if at any stage you do have an additional question or maybe a point that you would like to make feel free to stick it into the chat box there as we're having a discussion and we'll uh, we'll endeavor to get the, get your point raised as well so look we'll welcome we'll, we'll ask carl and liam uh, to join myself and gareth we'll maybe put our cameras on just so that we can put a faces to some of the names on the on this evening's webinar and we'll we'll start to make our way through these um through these questions so uh if Carl and, and Liam want to join us. And again, if you have any specific questions that you want a specific member of the group here to answer, or you would like a specific person's opinion, again, feel free to feel free to, to, to identify a particular person. The only, the only question, Connor, is off limits is when is when is the games? <laughs> so that's the only question that's off Connor. So you haven't got your crystal ball with you, Carl. No. no. Okay, so look, uh, the first one of the first questions, and this was one that we uh, we actually probably was submitted by more than one person, in fact, probably about four or five people. Uh, we struggle to get coaches. The, the, the gist of it is that we struggle to get club coaches, Carl. Well, I put this one to yourself, but we're not in a position to turn people away from it, whereas we're a small club. Those, however, that we do have in place generally only are concerned about their own age group and being successful at that age group. How best to change this? Yeah, well, that's that's a, that's a biggie. And... Um... You know, every every club needs to cut their cloth because they're they're from different uh, areas, different uh, numbers involved, and all that side of it. I suppose we like we're all coaches, mentors. Um, there is a there is a huge one to one element of this, and to try and uh, you know sell the benefits of being involved in coaching beyond the sport as well. So like we all coach in our daily lives with families and work and everything so the, the broad spectrum of coaching goes way beyond um you know, taking a taking a team within a club so without probably um you know overselling it I, w- I would try to encourage you know coaches to get involved because there there are other benefits that that you can use um outside of the, the world of GEA. Um, believe it or not, we do have lives outside of the GEA. And uh, you, using any of those one-to-one um, skills, and the more you do it, the, you, you know, the more you get better at it, and it's having those conversations. And I know from being involved in, in underage uh, football, and even with the county, um, that sort of communication piece is, is being um, probably eroded over time, and that one-to-one um you know having those direct conversations with people um it's not the same as it was because of all the other distractions which we all know about so i think you know upskilling yourself and how to have conversations you know that mentorship side the personal development side um like it is a real uh, privilege to be involved um in, in clubs and, and with teams um so it's probably disentangling ga and the sport out of it and, and selling the, the wider benefits i think yeah thanks Kurt. Super. Liam, uh, Liam Hardy there, if you could unmute yourself, I think, Liam, just so that we can access you, you could maybe let us know when you're there. Yeah, that all right yeah. there, Connor? Yeah, yeah, perfectly, and thank you. Thanks for joining us. Liam, I, I, just a question, and again, this was actually, it's a question probably we don't get that often, but certainly it was qu- submitted by two different people. At what age group would you recommend, Liam, players should start focusing on playing in specific positions? Well, uh, Connor, I think really the way the modern game's going, it's a benefit that players are sort of very versatile, more so even when we were playing years ago. Like you pigeonhole somebody just because their father played a certain position and the son heard of that position. And that was the way it was done in clubs. But we've moved on now. And a prime example is the Dublin team at the minute. Most of them fellas are comfortable anywhere in the field. And what we need to try to do is develop players who are decision, make the right decisions, can think on their feet and can play most roles. 
okay, you will have specific things like the man marker is nearly gone out of the game now, which hopefully it'll come back in. But I would like to say you don't really want to pigeonhole them too soon. You want to give them all the experience because once they get the experience with different positions, they become a richer player. And they'll be able to then, once they get into, the, say, senior level, they can sort of deal down one position. But the only danger sometimes the way clubs are, if you're too versatile, you usually find yourself along the sideline. <laughs> but I would, encourage, I would encourage everybody to sort of have a go at every every position, you know? Yeah, I agree. Have I, it to the player. I agree with that, Liam. Um, I certainly wouldn't be looking at positions or roles. Probably is more an upward uh, nowadays because there's a, there's only maybe a few roles on, on the pitch nowadays where there's there's multiple positions. So I wouldn't be uh, introducing it before goal games, definitely not. Um, I think... I think as coaches, we probably have a responsibility to coach children beyond that and uh, multiple roles. I think it's good for, for their own stimulus um, in terms of the child development. Um, and it's, it also helps their education as a footballer, I think, um, you know, to, 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 you know to, to get into it. Because I know from the transition into senior football, you'll, you'll definitely not be playing the same role as you were um, as you were maybe getting, getting into and out of minor. So... I think we have a responsibility to coach at least two roles for every player beyond goal games. Yeah. But no science to it. <laughs> yeah, Gareth, I'll put this one, I'll put this one to you. Um, and again, maybe Gareth, you would give us a, a maybe a spread of the, the, the type of responses you would get generally, maybe across the province, given your role with Ulster Council. Gareth, is it pra- is it beneficial to, for a club to have one coach taking the same team the whole way through their, their pathway? Um, listen, probably a question that's asked on a, on a daily basis when you're dealing with clubs, Connor, and a difficult enough one. Um, listen, there's there's no right or wrong answer to this in terms of you know should mommy or daddy be taking wee Johnny from under sixes right through? Um, probably being realistic, without mommy or daddy at under six, eight, and ten, or seven, nine, and eleven, you're not going to have a coach. You know, so like so being realistic, you know. That, that they are the people who, who are going to be coaching coaching our players. Um, my own opinion is if you have enough coaches in your club um, and that when you maybe get to under 13 and above, that if, if, if daddy has been involved with that child for five, six years, my suggestion would be, if possible, um, to either try and add, add more coaches into that coaching team or... <laughs> get a totally new set of eyes um, you know with the best will in the world you know we, we won't make I suppose we won't have preconceived ideas and we won't form opinions on the players we, as coaches we, we say we don't do it but again being realistic it probably happens um, but again on the flip side of that if, if daddy's there for the right reasons if he's a developmental coach if everyone's getting a, a game, if everyone's getting tried in different positions and, and they're creating that fun those environment and they've got the skill set, well, then there's probably nothing wrong with, with having mummy or daddy involved. Yeah, I would be in fine to agree with you, Gareth. I think that in this day and age, we're probably at, there's, there aren't too many clubs with that have people beating down the doors to get into coaching positions. And, you know, parents, parents are quite perhaps the easy option. You know, they're also a, a very valuable resource to you know that our club have access to. I think it's more about the individual themselves. You know, there's the right parent, and equally there's the wrong parent. And if, if you can get the right parent, well then you're probably on to a winner. Uh, let me see, we'll put uh, maybe this one, we'll put this one to Carl. Carl, um is it the rule? Sorry, we, we answered that one earlier. Uh, let me see. Carl, when does winning become important? Um at what at what stage should a coach's focus move from the developmental perspective more to a winning focused perspective? <laughs> it's never important if you're not winning. <laughs> uh, now, well, look, that that is a that's a winning and losing are unavoidable, really, uh, as we all know. Um, I suppose it's important for us as coaches to to understand the emotions of both uh, winning and losing, and you're going to get that with some teams and I'm not saying actively go out and tell people, you know, to, if you're involved in the team, go out and lose um, because you want to feel what that emotion is like. But I think, you know, I, I don't think coaches should be uh, mentioning winning at all. Um, if ever, like, you know, be, you know, especially not in juvenile um, set up, you know, it's, it's a personal development approach. It's long term. Um, you know, you want to reinforce the matches of, you know, how how they're 
performing, how they're competing against their skill development, all that side of it. Like, like then you start talking to players about the value of winning matches, but, you know, beyond that. Like, so I, I wouldn't put too much stock on, on, uh, you know, introducing winning too early. Like, um, if, if your juvenile coaches are talking about winning from under nine up, well, I think they need to be looking at a different job. Um, you know, so that's, that's probably, um, the brunt of it. Um, you know. Just, just by coming on that and Carl, I just think it's very important from a coach's role that the coach handles, if he can handle the winning and losing himself personally, he can pass that on to the players because the players will take the lead from the coach. You know, so and it is far too much now a win, 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 and it's driving the kids away. But I think if the coach can handle both win and lose the same times and spread that, that the players are winners all the time, if they give off their best in every scenario, like he's a winning coach right away, and he might yeah. win a th- he might win a trophy all year, you know. Yeah, well, look, they say it's a it's a byproduct of doing things well. So if if every player in your team or your squad or whatever was was you know, improving, getting the most out of themselves and, you know, focusing in on the skills, having the work rate and the attitude and all those things. And they're leaving every everybody behind them. Like, ultimately, you are going to have a team, you know, all of a sudden and you are going to start winning games. And But I don't think you should be introducing the word winning, uh, you know, at all at juvenile uh, level, you know. So, Thanks. Just my, inter- my interest. Sorry. Gareth, are you going to come in there? No. Okay, just interestingly, uh, we have one a, a question or a comment in from, I think it's Mark Fitzsimmons. Uh, Tyrone are set to adopt the new games model. Um, is this going to be replicated province wide? Uh, maybe, Carl, you'll come in on that. I suppose over the last number of, well, certainly from the initial lockdown period, the GEA put together a task force viewed at the uh, Kyan Outer Review of the existing Go Games practices with, across the association, province to province and county to county. So, look, it is something that is on the agenda, has been discussed in, in, in reasonable depth uh, by the Coaching and Games Committee over the last, certainly since uh, just pre-Christmas and post-Christmas. And it is something that, uh, look, I'll, I'll ask maybe Cory to come in here, but it is something that we're probably looking at um, with a view to implementation. Cory, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. Um... Just constant time. I know people probably want to get away at this stage, but uh, there there was a review, as Connor said, of Go Games nationally, and I'm sure you're reading them every weekend. But uh, there was recommendations made. Unfortunately, there was nobody from the six counties involved in that because of COVID and furlough and things like that. But in essence, um, counties are able to adapt the guidelines the best of their own needs without fearing too far off the, the framework. Um, so we're in the process of of looking at our own bespoke county guidelines. Now, in terms of answer, answering the question around Tyrone, I, I haven't seen the guidelines, so I couldn't say if if they're aligned to what, what Down are, are looking at. But look, there's there's been a positive discussion from coaching and games in Down. Um, there's nearly a broad consensus of where, where we need to go with it, um, with our own county-specific guidelines. Um, I think that the key elements are, are that we're probably not, not really implementing um some of the the guidelines which we would try and reinforce from an early age so for for example under seven and a half they're talking about five five e five and we're probably in practice not doing that um you know so it's probably on our clubs to try and reinforce that like as a coaching games committee we're not going to be checking every club we're not going to be monitoring this too too far we're just trying to um set out best practice and then clubs look ultimately clubs will just do their own thing, um, you know, but uh, I think we're just trying to edge it on, move it on, have a long ter- longer term approach. And before we get into talking about what the Morn Academy does, what the county's trying to achieve, this is fundamental. So the clubs and what they're doing at Go Games level, that is fundamental um, for all other aspects of the county. So um, hopefully that'll be, that'll be out in the next couple of weeks. And I said, that might go alongside some models of best practice from outside the county, which we hope to to put online with, through a webinar um, over the next couple of weeks. So uh, we'll keep an eye out for that. Okay, folks, look, assuming that we don't have any other questions there in the chat box, I think we will probably call it a night just at that. Um, thank you to everybody for calling in, for dialing in. We hope that you find this evening beneficial. Obviously, the focus was very much geared towards the, the role, responsibility and capacity of a club coaching officer. 
Um, moving forward over the next number of weeks, the focus will very much be coach specific uh, at, at four to seven, eight to 11 and 13 to six or 12 to 16, sorry. So we would strongly encourage that you, you ask as many of your coaches to log into those webinars as possible, either to their own age specific webinar or ideally if they're, if they're open to broadening their horizons perhaps or upskilling themselves further, maybe they'll log into all three of them. The same as the, uh, was the case for this webinar, I will be circulating a, uh, an event break registration uh, link to all the club coaching officers and club secretaries tomorrow. Again, please make sure that the, just for next week's webinar, that is, please make sure that it gets to the, the nursery age coaches within your club. And look, a lot of people have, you know, a lot of people submitted questions around coaches who are perhaps unwilling to upskill themselves or not overly motivated. This might be an opportunity if you can get them to log on to this to, uh, to upskill themselves and maybe we can spark a wee bit of interest in them or a bit of a fire in their bellies to improve themselves that perhaps club coaching officers might struggle to do. We have a good program of webinars over the next three weeks with a fairly detailed level of interactive content around the how, what and why to coach at specific age groups. And uh, we've no doubt that your, your coaches will benefit greatly, greatly from that. I will endeavour to share the uh, content of tonight's presentation, which we've recorded with everybody who has enrolled onto this workshop. So look, other than that, there's little left to be said. Thanks to Carl and Liam for coming on and giving us their expertise. Special word of thanks to Gareth, who uh, you'll see again next week. We hope that you found it beneficial. And as I say, hopefully you'll encourage as many of your coaches as possible to log in as appropriate over the next couple of weeks. Gareth,